API 209. I see some familiar faces in the audience, so thank you for coming. So this is a level 200 session. We're going to be talking about uh, AWS Step Functions and just showing you a little bit about Workflow Studio and how that works. So for those of you not familiar with Workflow Studio, it's a visual low-code uh, tool to, uh, to build out some Step Functions workflows. So I'm Ben Moses. I'm a principal SA from the UK, if you can't tell by the accent. And uh, I'll take you through this. I'll try and leave some time at the end for questions. Uh, but if there isn't, we run out. I'll be at the back there. Please you know, come and get me. Ask me whatever you like. So if we can flick over to the demo now. So can everyone see that OK? Is that visible? Nice. All right. And we already have some Amazon Q in the console look as well. Uh, right. So. How many of you have built with step functions before? Are we familiar with this? Is this fairly new? OK, so sort of half and half, maybe. So when we come in here, we have some really useful links on the left-hand side that so many customers uh, forget to look at, chief of which here is the online learning workshop. If you're not already familiar with step functions, I really encourage you to go and have a go with that. It takes you through some simple beginner examples all the way through to some more, exam uh, more complex workflows. For today, the plan is I'm going to show you an existing workflow, which is actually from our serverless espresso coffee booth, which, if you haven't seen yet, is on the other side of this wall where you can get yourself free coffee and learn about event-driven architecture. And then I'll just show you quickly how easy it is to build new workflows, too, in the console. So if I head over into State Machines here, and I give myself a bit of real estate, we're going to say bye to, to Amazon Q. All right. Let me zoom that just a little. Right. Let's use the order processor workflow. So this is one of the uh, state machines that you'll find inside Serverless Espresso. It's one of many, uh, and we, we build entire microservices out of it. So when we come into a state machine here, we have some details at the top. And we have some information about the executions at the bottom. And I'll show you that. But first, I want to get straight into Workflow Studio. So if we hit Edit, you'll see this nice, expansive canvas. Now, again, we're going to try and make some real estate for ourselves. All righty. So let me zoom that too for you. In the middle, you see a visual representation of the workflow. So it's represented as a graph for you. Makes it super easy to do these drag and drop operations, to reorder the actions that you have in there, and to understand what's going on. One of the reasons this is really exciting, actually, is you can sit down with business stakeholders where you're representing one of their workflows, and they can visually understand how it fits together and what all the different paths of it are. And you can agree together, that's what we intended to build. So super useful. So in the center, we have the canvas. As I say, it's an infinitely scrolling canvas where you can just keep dragging and dropping pieces into it. And on the left-hand side, we've got these three, three main panes. So you can see we've got some popular actions that you'd expect to see, things like Lambda, SNS, EventBridge, et cetera. But as you go down this list, you'll see there's actually quite a lot in here. What we've got in here is uh, over 200 services and 9,000 APIs that are available in AWS, where you can just drag and drop that on, maybe put some properties in, configure it slightly with a tiny JSON object, and off you go. It's doing the work for you without you having to write any custom code or to do anything yourself. So there's all sorts in here for all the popular services you might think of. And it wouldn't be reInvent if I didn't mention this service. So we now have that. This was released yesterday. So you can now invoke bedrock models directly in your workflows as part of what you're doing. As well as all of the actions that are available, we have all these flow states too. So we can start to do logic, and we can branch out. And you can see there's a little bit of in, in this workflow here. Last year at reInvent, we released something called distributed map which lets you iterate over hundreds of thousands of objects really, really quickly from S3 and to do distributed compute on those. And you can get some really fantastic results with that. So let's have a little look at what's going on here with this workflow. So like many things, we start at the start and we end at the end. Seems obvious, but worth saying. So in we come here. Now, the first action that we hit here is a DynamoDB, and it's get shop status. It wouldn't be much good if you came at 4 o'clock in the morning to find the shop closed, but it's still accepting orders. So there's a bit of business logic there around that. If any of you have ever written with any of the AWS SDKs before and tried to do stuff with Dynamo, you know that that can be quite fun. There's lots of different ways that you can access and retrieve data from that. With this, though, it's an optimized integration. And these optimized integrations, there's 17 of them, the objective with those is to just make your life simpler. So we make some assumptions on your behalf. 
We simplify things like the error retrying and the redrive, all those sorts of things. And we make sure that the response comes back to you in a simple to martial way. So it makes it easy to integrate. Down here, you can see all that we've had to pass in is the name of our Dynamo table and then the name of our primary key, which in this case is the config object. We want the whole thing to come back. So when our state machine runs, it will execute that. And the output of every state becomes the input of the next state. You can transform these along the way. And you can transform them before the object runs, during the object, or after it. So if we follow this example through what is intended to be the happy path, the store is open, baristas are available, coffee is in stock, we come down to one of these choice states. And all we have in here are some rules. So in this instance, we've got one that gets the result from that DynamoDB uh, call and looks at the Boolean value. If it's true, we go down to the next part of the happy path. And if for whatever reason that's not the case, we can fall down the side here and the shop's not ready and the process fails. We then come down, and this is a really interesting pattern that the serverless uh, developer advocates have built here. We have humans making coffee. We don't want to overwhelm them and allow hundreds of you to order coffee instantly. So we've implemented a bit of rate limiting here. And the way that we do it is that you need to think about a step function state machine like you do a Lambda function. You can have many parallel invocations of them. And one thing you can do is you can interrogate and find out information about yourself. So down here, we use the context object to get the ID, which is the ARN of our step function state machine. And we say, how many of these are currently in a running state? We can then pass that to a choice. And if there is relevant capacity still, there's not too many executions in parallel, we can continue down the happy path. Or we can take some branching logic and just say, we don't want to serve that right now. And if you've been to the serverless espresso booth, that's one of the things that helps you to see whether there's a, a QR code available or not for you. So we sort of consume that as a counter. The last piece I'll really draw attention to here is one of the integrations here for EventBridge. And it uses one of the configuration options that gets really interesting with these in distributed systems. And that is down here, it is wait for callback. So with a standard step functions workflow, we can actually have it mid-execution waiting for something to happen for up to 365 days without you paying for that. So you don't pay for waiting. So if you have a process where maybe you need to go and get a human review, maybe you need to go wait for some other system to do something asynchronously and then call back, you don't pay for waiting. So in this example, we're emitting an event to EventBridge, where in the context of this architecture, we know there are other systems that care about that event and will respond to it. And when they do, they get handed a task token. When they're happy that they've done their work, they call back to step functions with that task token, and they can either pass a success or a failure state. And depending on what we get back, again, we can take different branching routes off of this. So rather than me carry on explaining the definition of this, I'm going to exit out of Workflow Studio. And I'm just going to show you an example of one that we've already executed before, simulating a real human coffee order. So in here, we've got some general information about the execution at that particular point in time, including the number of state transitions that take place. And that's the billing metric for a standard state machine. It's how many of those transitions you went through. Down here, you get a visual graph. So very similar to what you saw in the Workflow Studio Editor, but this is actually representative of the path that it took. And if for whatever reason you have something that's still in a waiting state, you'll see that with the blue highlight, you know that you're waiting for that callback. Maybe a state was, had an error. You can dive into it and find out more. For any of these states, you can click on these, and you get more information on the right-hand side. You will see what the input was. So this was the API call that started this workflow off. And you'll see the entire body of that. And you'll see the output as well. Now, one of the things you can do with this input and output chaining is to append the previous information on with the new information so that you end up at the end of your workflow with an entire graph of all the data that was available. So in this case, you have all of the input data that came in from the API call, but you also have all the information down here from Dynamo. So super useful. And you can see how this choice status operated. You can see what the definition of that was too. So we're looking for that Boolean value. Was the store open, true or not? And you can see that it took the happy path and came down. 
This is the graph view, but there is also a table view, which I think for me is some, somewhat reminiscent sometimes of uh, the X-ray view in the sense that it shows you the timeline. So if you have expensive long-term operations, you can see where that time was taken, which bits took the longest. Underneath all of this, we've got a history of all the events. So you can see for every single action block in your workflow, when it started, when it was processing, when it finished that job, and what the result of it was. And you can expand each of these and get an absolute wealth of information out about what happened. So when you're trying to debug these and understand what's going on, how it got to the answer it got to, it makes it really, really useful for that. One of the things that you will notice now when you go back into this editor is we talked about the, the visual nature of this and how you can see your components in there. In the background, what it's doing is it's actually storing this as something we call Amazon States language, so ASL. So it's a JSON-like document where each of these is represented as an object, uh, which has a, a key of next, which shows you which object it should link to next. So one thing we see developers do is they often use Workflow Studio to mock something up early, test an idea, try it out, see if it's going to work or not. And then you can take that ASL back into your IDE, make it part of your code base, and then edit from there on. If you have small changes to make, feel free to do that there. But if you have more fundamental changes, you can bring it back into Workflow Studio here, do some more visual edits, and then take it back out again if you want to. So it helps with that. If you're using the AWS plugin for things like VS Code, you can actually open your ASL file, go into the command palette, and say, I want to render the state machine. And it will show you the visual representation of that state machine there. So you can see if you're editing this by hand in your IDE, have you done it in a syntactically correct way, and does it actually look how you expect it to look? So that's an example of an existing one. And I wanted to show you now just quickly what it's like to create a new one. So if we come back into the console here and do create state machine, uh, this is a relatively new feature that's really nice. Uh, we have some templates for some common patterns that we see. If any of you have been to our serverless DA website before, serverlessland.com, there's even more on there where you can download them from GitHub, deploy them, learn more about the individual patterns. And you can see here they're also divided up by use case and also which services they're integrated with. So whilst those are great, I'm going to start with a blank canvas today. And I'm going to show you a really, really simple example here. So I mentioned earlier we've got hundreds of service integrations in here. I'm going to go for S3 list buckets. And it's as easy as dragging and dropping that into the canvas here. And you'll notice that snapping behavior. If you have more things that you want to add, they will snap before and after wherever you drop them in the flow. So if you know the S3 list buckets API, you know it's a fairly simple one. By default, you don't actually have to pass any parameters to it, and you'll just get a list of buckets back. So I'm going to hit Create, and Step Functions is going to do something here to try and help me. And that is everyone's favorite, I am. So where possible, it will pre-create all of the relevant policies in a new I am role for you. Where there's some sensitivity around data, it will give you instructions about how to do this yourself. So here, you'll notice it's quite happy to go and add the relevant X-ray policy for me. But because we're accessing information from S3, it's telling me I need to be responsible for that. So I'll hit Confirm. And you'll see that going off and creating. And you get this warning banner at the top just to remind you that there are some required permissions, and these for S3. If I'd have created a more advanced state machine with many, many, many objects in there, it will have had a go at doing absolutely as much as possible for me, and then it gives me a comprehensive list of all the other things that I need. So I'm going to hit Edit Role in IAM. And we'll see the automatically created role there. I'm going to be a little bit lazy because this is a live demo. And I'm going to add the uh, common S3. Don't fail me now. Uh, I'm going to add Amazon S3 read-only access for now. I won't go full admin. I don't want to upset anybody. So that policy is attached to the role now. And I'm going to come in here and just start an execution of the state machine. I don't care what the input is for this particular one because I'm not relying on it like I was with the Serverless Espresso example. So for here, I'm just going to hit Start Execution. And that's ran, and that's succeeded already, thankfully. And you can see down here, we talked about this graph view before. So I can see there's one operation, list buckets. And the output was here. So I have uh, an object called buckets with a list of all of the buckets in my 
account here. So nothing too exciting, some stuff for SAM CLI, and uh, a few just audit policies that we have by default in there. But that shows you how you can start to mock these things up quite quickly and how you can start to integrate with services. From here, you can go edit and you can come back in. And maybe you want to think about something like some error handling. So let's do that just quickly. Um, if we come into error handling here, we can retry on errors. And we can add policies around how we want to retry those things and after how many times we want to fail. We can also catch some errors too. So when you come in here, you don't have to have one sort of catch-all branch for everything. You can be specific about the type of error that you're catching. I'll pick all for now just to have one branch. And then what is your fallback state? So in the event of an error, where do you want to go? And you can have all sorts of complicated logic in here if you want to. I'm going to add a new state. And let's imagine that there's somebody who cares about this. And I'm going to publish a message to SNS. And we're going to go and alert a human that Ben's list bucket operation has failed. So what you'll notice is it labels the line here for you. I hope that's visible. If it's not, I'll, I'll zoom in a little. And you can see there's a catch state there. And as I say, if you chose to catch different types of errors, you can have lots of different branches here. And then this line here represents the default, which is to go to the next state. If you had things you wanted to do after this, so maybe you wanted to go and, I don't know, you wanted to go and read an object and do something. Uh, let's do read object. Let's come to that later. The same vocal lambda function, make life easy for me. There we go. So you just drag and drop these into the canvas. And you can keep going and keep going with this. And as I said before, if you remember, everything in here is represented as ASL. So you can come back here and you can see in code what this is represented as. So we've got about five minutes left, so I'm happy to take any questions.